So we're going to talk about the first step of programming, which is process design, otherwise known as the requirements phase. Okay, so think back to the four steps of problem solving, orient, plan, execute, and test. Um, these apply to any kind of problem solving, but we're going to use it in the realm of programming. If you think about working in a business, there are lots of different kinds of business processes, like doing the payroll, fulfilling an order, taking inventory, billing. Each of these processes can be complex. Each one benefits from having a well-defined definition. So the overview of how we do process design in the context of our general problem solving framework is, okay, we start with orientation, the orient phase, which is developing requirements. And we're going to go into this more deeply. Basically, this will involve use cases and tests. Then once we have our requirements, we're going to plan how to do it. And this means, in our case, designing the user interface, identifying the objects, planning the flow of action. And this phase is typically called the specification. Executing, for us, will be implementing the process, and then checking will be using the tests that we developed in the requirements phase to make sure that our process as implemented actually does what we wanted it to do. The first couple steps of defining a process include uh, start with orienting. So what that's about is saying what you want to have happen, talking about inputs and outputs. What we're going to do is write use cases to make sure we cover all the possibilities and define tests to make sure everything works properly. And then comes the planning phase, which is designing the user interface and figuring out and specifying how things should work. Uh, we'll use flowcharts for this, or at least I'll introduce them for you as a tool. Both of these major stages are done before you get to the implementation. Okay, so what is the use case? How do we do our orientation? Well, what we want to do is think through scenarios of how our process is going to work. What this does is it helps us visualize the process. It helps us refine our understanding. We may come up with problems that could happen uh, that you wouldn't think of just right off the bat, but by walking through the process, then you come across them. Now, usually there's one or more normal versions of the process. We'll do those first, and then we'll think of unusual cases that could come up and how we're going to deal with those. Okay, so at least for us, in the use case, what we're go it's going to involve going through exactly one scenario of doing the process. And it has to be testable. So for each use case, we're also going to define one or more tests to use. The set of use cases should cover all the possible scenarios. Of course, there may be too many to do each individual possible case in one at a time. So in that case, we would try to group them and at least do a representative one from each group. It's very important that we're defining the tests before we do the design. This ensures that the process really does what we want it to do, especially in unusual cases. Otherwise, what you end up with is design for the normal cases, and whatever happens in the usual cases just happens. Often, it's not what you would have done if you had actually thought it through. So this is an important part of the design. Okay, now there's a lot of new vocabulary and concepts here, so we're going to illustrate them with a simple example. And we're going to talk about getting candy from a candy machine. So let's start with what. What is supposed to happen? And coming up with the test. So this will be the orient phase. Here's a picture of a typical candy machine. Hopefully most of you have interacted with one of these. And the question is, what should happen? So just off the top of our head, you know, thinking about a simple candy machine, well, you put a coin in the slot, you turn the handle, and candy comes out. You might be tempted to stop there, but there's other factors. What if the machine's empty? What should happen? What if the user puts the wrong coin in the slot? What if the user tries to turn the handle without putting a coin in the slot? You know every four-year-old is going to do that. Uh, what if a coin receptacle is full? So we have to consider each of these as well as the normal case of putting in the coin, turning the handle, and getting the candy. Okay, so let's 
refine our first use case, the normal one, to be the user puts the correct coin in the coin slot and turns the handle. There is candy in the machine. The coin receptacle is not full. So the handle turns and the candy comes out. And our test is to just put the proper coin in, turn the handle, and see if we get the candy. And we want to do it more than once to make sure that it doesn't just work the first time. Okay, that's the first case. Second case, what if we have an empty machine? Now, what should happen well, we get to define that, right? This is an unusual case, so we're going to come up with what we think should happen. So the user puts the correct coin in the coin slot and turns the handle. There's no candy in the machine, and the coin receptacle is not full, so the handle will turn, and no candy comes out. So what are we saying? We're saying that if you put a coin in an empty machine and turn the handle, the machine will eat the coin and no candy will come out. Well, is that fair? Is that what we really want to do? It's a trade-off, and this is where the uh, requirements process really comes in. You know, we could have said, oh, well, in that case, the handle won't turn, but that would mean the machine would have to somehow know that it doesn't have any more candy, and that might be too expensive for the way we want to build the machine. So there are trade-offs to consider on how it works. What we're doing is making the machine clear so you can see if there's no candy, and if you see there's no candy and you still put a coin in and turn the handle, well, we feel okay about taking your money. Okay, what if it's a wrong or bad coin? So the user puts a wrong coin in and tries to turn it. Well, we can pretty easily make a machine where the handle won't turn all the way unless the coin is the right size. But what if it's a fake coin, like a wooden coin? There used to be a saying, don't take any wooden nickels. So. We want the handle to not turn, but, uh, you know, there's a limit of how good we can be at recognizing counterfeit coins. So again, there's a trade-off here. How much can we afford to spend on this machine? Okay, no coin. If there's no coin in the slot, we want the handle to not turn. And our test is try to turn the handle with no coin in the slot. It should not turn. We need to know it's feasible to build a machine like this. Okay. What if the coin receptacle is full, so you can't turn the handle because there is no place for the coin to go into the receptacle? Well, okay, so that's how we want it to work. The, the handle just shouldn't turn if the receptacle is full. It's one thing to say this. It's another thing to actually build it. So you have to think about it. The requirements are something we're going to give to a designer who will plan how to build this machine. It might be feasible. might not be feasible. They'll get back to us. So this may not be a one-step process. There may be an interaction, a period of interaction, between the requirements person and the designer, even if it's the same person, about whether these requirements can really be implemented. Uh, that's part of the normal design process for something like this. Okay, another factor. What if there are two problems at once? What should happen then? For example, the receptacle is full and the machine is empty. Well. We said that for an empty machine, the machine should take the money. But for a full receptacle, the handle won't turn. So we actually covered this by putting in the condition that the receptacle is not full in the case of an empty machine. But we do have to think about these kind of interactions. What if there are two problems? What if there are three problems? Which uh, rule should take precedence and make sure we understand and, spec and, and say that in the requirements? Okay, now, of course, there's a lot more to the candy machine. We're, we're only covering the part that deals with the person who wants to buy the candy. What about the owner? How do they get the money? How does the owner refill the candy? Those things would have to be specified, too. And then there's a whole business plan, which we're not talking about either. Uh, you know, do we rent the machines? Do we sell them? How much does the candy cost? How much do we charge? Who collects the money? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, those are beyond our scope, so we're not going to deal with those. But I just want to say, even for this very simple case, it's more complicated than you might have thought. Okay, so that's the what. That was an example of doing the requirements. And we've developed some tests to go with our use cases. That was the orient step. So next is the specification step, that, the how. And again, this is not always a linear process. 
we may be doing some requirements, going to the design, seeing that there's something about the requirements that doesn't work, coming back and changing the requirements, doing the design again and iterating until we get a set of requirements and a design that we can live with. It's much more expensive to change things after you sent the plan to the factory and built the machine, right? Then you have to scrap all these machines if you want to change something. So it's, this is why, one reason why doing these initial steps carefully and thoroughly is so important because it's much cheaper to change the plan than it is to change the objects after they've been built. Within this process, good communication is totally vital. The person who does the requirements may or may not be the same one as the one who does the design. There may be, need to be discussions, and we need a good tool for communicating the requirements and also the design back to the requirements person. So next time when we talk about specifications, we'll look at that.